Welcome to Season 2, Episode 8 of the Oso Spurs podcast, where news is just breaking that Tottenham are on the verge of signing a new centre-back. Um, we miss Ange Ball terribly, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, some other areas such as Romero's injury scare, and maybe that Harry Kane interview if we have time as well. But we've got an almost full house today. We've got Deej back, who's a bit poorly. How are you, Deej? I, um, I've, I've been better. Been better. <laughs> well, thanks for persevering with us today. We've got Johnny. How are you, mate? Thank you, Gullerese, right now, which is probably a zero. Because I'm waiting. Well, I'm missing Ange Ball, and I'm off to watch Ireland play Holland. So it's not, <laughs> not a great sort of situation, but yeah, good, good to be here. Good to have you. And we, of course, have Stu. How are you, mate? Great. Just had a barbecue outside in 40 degree weather. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Very envious of that. Well, guys, we've signed a centre back out of nowhere. I did not expect that today, and it just just goes to show again. I don't think the journalists really know what's going on like they used to in terms of these transfers, but he's called um, Luka Vuskovic. Uh, he's Croatian. He was scouted by Man City and PSG, and we apparently won this race. It was an over 12 million bid from Manchester City, apparently. Um, but what do we know about him, guys? Uh, Deej and Stu and Johnny, I know you guys have done some research, but um, Deej, I'll start with you. What, what do you know about him? Um, well, I think probably the most impressive thing um, about him is that he broke into the uh, Hatchick split um, first team at 16. Like, basically, he was like 16 years, two days old, essentially, when he made his first start. And then he scored his first goal. Obviously, he's a center back, so this doesn't really matter. But he scored his first goal like three days later, um, making him, I think, one of the youngest scorers for them as well. Um, if not the youngest, I'm not going to fact check that right now. But um, yeah, I mean, he's a really exciting prospect. Uh, I don't think he's necessarily going to get game time this season. But I said that about Ashley Phillips, and he's already in. Uh, the first team, which is really exciting for a signing like him, which would, you know, make him a maybe a an A-rated signing or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, he's tall, he's fast, he's strong, he's young, he's exciting. I don't know. <laughs> really all you can ask for in a signing like this. What about you, uh, Johnny? Have you done some homework on this guy? I mean, to be honest with you, I think most of us, probably all of us, have never heard his name until about an hour ago, so... Like it's 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 whatever websites we can find in that time, and <laughs> he just covered nearly everything. The only things that he's apparently like he still he has played for the um the first team in Hajduk, but but he's still playing for the under nineteens as well, and he's apparently their top scorer at the moment. So for a defender, he's obviously a goal threat as well, and he is very very tall. He's like one point nine three meters. So, um, yeah, I I I've just the bits I've read like he's made when when he came into the defense, um. Like they'd been leaking goals pretty drastically, and, and that's he, he did shore things up a bit. So, um, yeah, no, the, the, that's it. Just seemed, seemed to be that Man City and PSG were both in for him and made bids. And it said that PSG had a bid accepted, but obviously that wasn't the, the, the conclude for whatever reason. So, it, it's interesting to see that Tottenham, that, that Tottenham ran for players like this. I don't see him getting the game any time soon, but like Stu was saying in the group earlier, it's like. We're obviously looking around, and the the scouting network is um, looking in all sorts of places that maybe um, haven't we've not been tapping into for a while. I don't know, but like it's uh, it's an exciting signing for down the road, mm. I suppose. Uh, I can't imagine well, him breaking in at the first team as much as we need centre centre backs. Well, I disagree with you guys, but first let's hear from Stu. <laughs> all right, dive into that. <laughs> uh, Gosh, yeah, you... I, I think it's brilliant. I think you know the fact. That the last 12 months we've invested in a lot of youth signings is a great sign for the future. Um, but also from what I was reading, either the first or second game that he played for the first team was the derby. So that shows that, you know, he's clearly mentally strong. Um, and from what I've read, they play the same type of, you know, possession-based high-pressing football that we do. Um, he's quick, good in the tackle, uh, apparently very good at anticipating the you know the, the flow of the game, which for a 16 year old defender is remarkable. Um, can play anywhere, up, you know, across the back, back three, back five, back four. So, you know, I, I'm just excited. I, I agree with Johnny. I, I don't think he's going to be signed for the first team, but then again, who knows? And especially the fact that you know he's has chosen us over Man City and Paris Saint Germain makes me think. Ange has maybe promised him that if he does 
hit the ground running in the under 18s or under 23s that you know he'll be given a chance so i'm i'm yeah. pleased yeah, th this is the bit where I I disagree on one area of what you guys said, and that is that he's just not going to play for us this season. To me, of course, he's not going to be able to actually join until January the 1st, unless there's some kind of loophole to do with a player being a certain age, which we're not aware of, and it's unlikely. It seems very um, unlikely that he's going to be in the team until January 1st, even though we agree a deal in principle. But it just seems too coincidental that we've signed another centre-back, which is the position we effectively needed to get done in the last window that we couldn't quite get over the line in time. Um, and that we beat PSG and Man City to a player and he chooses us without some kind of reassurance that he's going to get game time sooner. Maybe that's me being a bit deluded and optimistic that this is kind of getting ready ahead of the January transfer window already. Um, but uh, the other thing with Ange is he said before in interviews, he, do he doesn't buy into this whole, you need X previous experience or need to come from X division or play to X level, like we saw with Ashley Phillips. It's purely, if you have the right mentality, and you tick the right boxes for me in terms of attributes, you're in. And it's as simple as that. And he found bargains in Japan and kind of opening up that, you know, the likes of Mituma and those kind of players, which he always admired, he knew about for everyone else. Um, yeah, maybe I'm just a bit, bit of a romantic that, um, that there's some, <laughs> some plan yeah. there to bring him in in January. But, I, yeah, I think, we go. you know, obviously one of our best signings ever came from that league. Uh, who has now been probably the best midfielder of his generation for the last 15, 20 years. True. Um, and then what was the name of the, the other player we were looking at? Danny Olmo, who's also gone on to play well after leaving that league. So maybe, you know, that league is a higher quality than than sometimes we, we think of these minor leagues. Yeah. Interesting. Has he ever played at uh, its senior international level? I don't think no. so. Has he? No, I don't think Only so. Only no. under 17s, I think he's yeah. he's currently playing at. So, yeah, yeah I, it will be interesting to see. But um, yeah, does anyone else have anything else? I mean, he obviously plays in the back four, like we've said. I'm going to play on both sides, which is great. He's fast, he's big, and he's strong. Just to summarise, so he does sound like a good potential fit as a, even if it's third choice, fourth choice backup. I mean, what other kind of you'd rather sign? a young, exciting centre-back with loads of potential than, personally, I would than a 34-year-old who's washed up and no one else wants, um, or Somewhere just equivalent in the middle, to someone maybe. like Eric Dyer, who I, just doesn't fit the system um, anymore. So, yeah, Tim, yeah. Tim but like, I, I yeah. think it's I mean, what you're saying. I think you made a great point about um, like avenues to the first team. I'm not sure that, there would, that he would have chosen us over the likes of PSG and City if there wasn't that. Because while PSG and City probably have two of the best academies in the world when it comes to like pumping out talent, I mean, that talent, as we've seen, is kind of just being used to go or skirt like FFP regulations. So I think I think some younger players potentially are more. I don't want to say catching on to it, but like realizing that signing like with them wouldn't necessarily guarantee them an avenue to the first team. Which is, I guess, a bit advantageous to us because we can say to really like exciting young prospects like this, we can say, hey, you could go there or you could come here. You do well. There's a spot on the bench for you. Prove yourself. Yeah, that's true. I'm just going to say that I think Ange has also shown in the you know, little time he's been with us that he's got rid of all the old guard and is only playing the youngsters, Udoji, uh, Sar, you know, on the, on the van, he's brought in, you know, the youngster. So I think, you know, he can show to people he's trying to sign that, you know, it's not just talk, but it's actual actions on his behalf. I completely agree. I think there's um, plenty of examples like Van de Ven and, and obviously Ashley Phillips recently that imply that Ange isn't shy of chucking a, a first player into the team more quickly than us fans would have would have expected to. So let's watch this space, but let, let's not dwell on this topic for too long. We've unfortunately had to deal with a lot of international football lately. Um, I say unfortunately because we're so spoilt with Ange Ball that I just want it in my life every weekend and an international break is just infuriating. But there were a lot of Tottenham players uh, playing on the weekend as well that we've got to talk about. Um, should we start with James Madison and, and his performance, guys? Like it was, it seems I got kind of PTSD of Conte Ball watching England back to that kind of negative football and and watching Kane and Madison, I thought, would these two ever really work in the same team? Because Kane kind of does the job you kind of expect Madison to be doing, dropping deep and playing those balls. Um, but what did you guys think about Madison's performance versus Spurs in that England setup? Um, Deidre, start with you. What do you reckon? I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to judge a player 
uh, who's playing in Gareth Southgate's system next to uh, Jordan Henderson, who, despite his best efforts, continues to make it into the starting 11 every week uh, or every international break, which is mind blowing to me. Um, But yeah, I don't know. It's just every international manager to an extent is going to play a worse version of football than the one that we are blessed to watch every weekend that international break is not occurring. But I don't know. Gareth Southgate's is a, it, it's very, it's very tournament oriented. I think I'd say uh, he, very much a grinded out win on set pieces. And that's the kind of stuff that'll get you far, but it's, it's so awful to watch and it'll ruin a lot of players who have the capacity to be better in a better system. I think. Yeah. Um, what about you, Stu? Yeah, I mean, as you guys know, I, I'm not a big fan of Southgate at all. Um, I think he's a flat-track bully. He's, you know, Everyone's like, look at the great results he has. He's a successful manager. No, he's not. Because every time we play a decent team, after beating the Tides, we should be, we lose. Um, and we were 1-0 up in the semi-final of the World Cup, 1-0 up in the final of the Euros, and due to him not being clever enough to make changes to counter what the opposition were doing, we lost both of them. Um, and I think the fact he selects players like Maguire, Phillips, Henderson, who shouldn't be anywhere near the squad, just kind of sums him up. And I think yesterday, you know, he was saying himself that he had um, Madison out on left and wanted him to come into the middle where he could do damage, but that's also where Bellingham does his damage. And that's where Kane drops deep to do his damage. So everyone was kind of tripping over each other's feet. And, you know, I just thought it was a, kind of summed up Southgate of having lack of thought of what he actually wanted his side to do. Mm. Yeah. It just goes again to show how much of it is down to the manager and the system and how lucky we are to, I say lucky, how refreshing it is to have the, the style of play back that we, we know and started to love Tottenham for, which is the attacking football. And then on steroids with that, we've got a manager who's, who's brought, you know, the best of the best when it comes to attacking football and Ange. But um, any other players on the international duty that caught your eye? There were compilations of Romero going around. I saw a little niggle of an injury. Um, did you, you guys go on teach? I mean, uh, Romero uh, obviously had a man of the match performance um, against Ecuador, uh, which was, I mean, and then obviously the Messi quote calling him the best in the world, to which every Arsenal fan was like, he's not even top 15. Where so, because I'm supposed to judge someone who's, you know, paid 10 bucks for a blue check over the greatest football player of all time. Is Messi a bit biased? Sure. But that's not going to stop me from using it in every argument from now on. Um, but yeah, he did really well. Uh, Kulisevsky uh, had, a, had a good game against Estonia. Um, I think we've all seen the Basuma assist. But if you haven't, please go find that as quickly as possible. Go pause the podcast, watch the video, come back. Because it is absolutely beautiful. Just destroys that poor goalkeeper. Um, Hoyfier scored against San Marino. Uh, who cares? It's San Marino. Uh, yeah. And then we've had a couple other, a couple of good performances. I think Paris has got an assist or two. Uh, and I think that covers the good performances from us on international break. I'm not going to talk about the bad one. <laughs> yeah, the, God, she, no, the, the bad one is one I, I, I just, my heart breaks for the kid because obviously he cares so much. And it's just not working for him at the moment, and it's mm. it's terrible. Yeah, and then there's uh, assuming we're always talking about Richie, right? Yeah, um, yeah it's the the worst thing with it all. I think is it seems to he seems to be the type of personality who is so passionate. The more it gets in the head, the worse the issue is just compounding, and it's just like spiraling into a much bigger deal than it needs to be. And I kind of I hate to keep harping back to Conte, but I kind of blame him partly for not knowing. In the same way that Jose doesn't manage. He doesn't manage certain personalities well at all, whereas some managers treat individuals like individuals and how they react to pressures and, and criticism. It seems like Conte completely broke his, his confidence and Ange is just so ruthless. He's not going to have time to just, you know, overly fixate on him. He just needs to get the focus on the bigger picture with the team and, you know, treat Richardson like an adult and say, kind of, you've got to kind of, it's up to you. You'll get chances. If you can't take them. There's not much more I can do um, for you apart from kind of put an arm around your shoulder and tell you it's going to be okay, which he did do in the interviews. He's never thrown Richarlison under a bus like Conte would have. So, yeah, sad to see. 
sad to see, but hey, it's a long season ahead. I, I did find it funny that the big hyped up Sun versus uh, Johnson game ended up in a nil nil draw. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was the other performance I was referencing. Yeah. <laughs> Do we, do we think on that? Um, I know Johnson played number nine again. Um, Who cares, is, man? Two is, Conte uh, ball coaches. Yeah, no, but I'm not not to that point. I'm just, as time's going on, the more and more I'm thinking Johnson's going to be replacing Kulisevsky against yeah. Sheffield United and starting ahead of him. Am I the only one? Am I like, because I don't get how else it fits. I, I'm convinced yeah. he's been bought for the right wing to basically challenge Kulu and Kulu hasn't regained the form he had in the first six months with us so I think ultimately you know it's either going to bring out the best of Kulu or Johnson will take that position I mean he, he's his characteristics are everything that Angebol seems to want so I, I feel maybe, a bit yeah. I was going to say maybe Kulu will ultimately uh, come into the middle um, yeah which I think mm. will be more to his forte in Angebol yeah, I think Kulu's strength becomes his unfortunate, um, not weakness, but it kind of works against him is that he's a versatile player that's played at, you know, in several different, well, four or five different positions. And coaches always go, oh, well, I'll upgrade him. And then he can become the squad option again. He can cover left, he can cover right, he can cover central. Um, he can even cover wing back. So I think that kind of might be slowly happening to Kulu again. <laughs> what do you think, Deej? Yeah, I mean, everyone has kind of, I mean, not everyone, but, you know, there have been people who have been uh, wanting to see Kulu in a more central role, which I think would be uh, very interesting. Um, not necessarily saying that that's his, his final position, but I mean, I don't know. We wanted to see Sun centrally, and that worked pretty well. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if Johnson will necessarily start. Um, I would like to, I would, if he did, that would be a very good sign to say that he's like betting into the system pretty well, but I would, I would assume it would be, I would assume it would be Solomon, Son, Gulusevsky, and then Johnson coming off the bench against Sheffield United, just because he's, I mean, we bought him immediate international break. He hasn't had as much time with the squad to kind of bet in like these other players have. But I do think that, um, I do think that he has the characteristics to fit an Ange ball right winger better than Kulusevsky. Hmm. I'm just so excited to have the pace of Johnson in that team. I think on the counter, we're just going to blitz certain teams who play a high press back at us. I think the two games I think are going to be absolutely, three games are going to be absolutely mental this year. And we're going to obviously have to see them unfold twice, each of them. I think Liverpool versus Spurs is just going to be an insane goal fest. Yeah. Arsenal versus Spurs is going to be an insane fixture as well. Um, Brighton, actually, I think as well will be will be a crazy crazy fixture and of course City will be absolutely mental I think the sign that we're really good again might ironically be that we actually just lose out to City <laughs> um, going head to head in attacking football um, at least uh, away from home I think we, we you know it's Man City yeah, away from home but it's going to be some super exciting games against those big big six teams it's going to be so ironic that Ange is going to be the first manager that let City score and win at White Hart Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he's the best manager we've had yeah. in 10 years or whatever. It's gonna, yeah, it's probably going to happen. And we'll have the highest league finish, I reckon, um, over the last five years at least under Andrew. I did the stats, by the way, on that. If you finish, a bit of stats here. If you beat everyone outside the top six and you lose every game against the top six, you would finish top four. I think it was eight out of the last 10 seasons. Yeah, it makes so, sense. It's so that it just goes to show, and I think under Ange, we will win 80% of the games, or even 90% of them outside the top six. Maybe I'm being a bit overly optimistic with that, but I kind of feel those are the kind of games we'll win. And so that just goes to show, we just need to pick up two or three wins against top six. And why not? Why not think we can be ahead of schedule and get into that top three or top four this season? I've got one of them already. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. We've already got one, if you count that, that those lot as uh, top six these days, I think. They're a bit fraudulent in where they are on the table, but there you go. Um, do you guys want to touch a bit on that Kane interview where he kind of insinuated that we didn't have a winning mentality or is that just him picking up Bayern Munich because it's his new club and you have to do that as a player? Are we overthinking it and being sensitive as Spurs fans? Keen to get your guys' thoughts on, on the interview. I think he's, um, he's had a couple of digs. Um, 
it's not the first time he's mentioned anything. Um, and I think he could have said comments picking up Bayern and the opportunity to play for a big, huge, because they are a big, huge club, uh, and the challenge of the Champions League without having to say, here's a winning mentality and at Spurs, they don't have one, especially when he was supposedly a leader in that lesson, you know, that dressing room. Mm-hmm. What about you, Deej? Do you think it was personal to get Spurs or do you think it was just we're taking it too much personally and medias have put, taken words out of context? I mean, it's, I don't care. He's not a Tottenham player anymore. He's kind of telling on himself, honestly. Like yeah. you're, I mean, he wasn't ever the captain, but he was the biggest personality. He was the person that everyone outside of the club associated with him. If you say that losing a couple of games isn't the end of the world, that's because your mentality is weak, not because the club's is. Yeah. And we're going to touch on this in the midweek pod, but I think it sparks off a good debate to have. Um, so in, in the midweek episode on Wednesday, we're actually going to have a guest from um, one of the leading Sheffield United podcasts on to help us uh, scout their team and understand how they're going to set up. But also there's a really good question. And I think um, Jack on, on Rule the Roost mentioned that he'd been having this chat in the pub with one of his mates or whatever. But it was, who has the bigger impact on your culture? Is it the chairman or is it the manager? And who is more important to that? And there's so many polarizing examples we can go into them, but there's like the Sir Alex Ferguson example of what happens to a club when someone like him leaves. But there's the Real Madrid example of doesn't seem to matter what manager they get in the door, they always win. So I think that's going to be a really interesting debate. Um, and also obviously the most recent one with Ange, we wanted him because he is the type of personality that can overhaul a culture from top to bottom. And that's what we felt we needed as a football club as a key reason why I'm wanting him. But um, I think that'll be... Uh, be really interesting um was there anything else you guys wanted to add on to this week's episode um go on Deej. Uh, i was gonna say just an add-on to the luka vuskovic thing it looks like because of um brexit and eu rules he will not be able to join us until he turns 18 right so he's signing a pre-agreement or... basically and i think he'd stay at uh Hadjuk, um i don't know how to pronounce that per- Hadjuk split yeah, Hedrick, okay, good. I, was, I, didn't, I just want to make sure I wasn't but, butchering it. Uh, he's, he'll stay a Hedrick split until um, until he, he turns 18. So he's not Which allowed is... to join us, or he's not allowed to play for us? Um, it, uh, from some cursory research, it looks like because of Brexit, we aren't allowed to sign U18 players from the EU anymore. So, mm. yeah. That's that's a little frustrating, isn't it? But we don't go into politics on this podcast. So we'll park that one there and just say, oh, well, he was assigning for the future anyway, and we're going to sign someone better in January. Ready for the first year. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so that, that answers that question. You can disregard all my optimism at the start of the podcast that he was going to be slotting into the team. Trust in Ashley Phillips, I guess, is the answer for now. Sorry, <laughs> and I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Um, and also, yes, please, like, this becomes like some weird monotone thing, monotone thing but don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the podcast. It really helps us out. And even if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, whatever the audio ones are, if you, when it asks you to give five stars at the end, please do it because that um, also really helps boost us up the charts. And we've recently broken into the top 100 football podcasts in the entire category. So we want to keep flying up those charts. So thanks for listening and, and thanks for the, the kind reviews and, and recurring listens. Um, but yeah, up the Spurs and uh, roll on Ange Ball one week today. Okay, on your Spurs. Oh, one week. One Less than a week today. Up the Spurs. Up the Spurs. <laughs>